Well, hey, everybody. Uh, my name is Jared Malad. I'm here with my good friend, Matteo Caliz. This is The Cultist, Season 2, Episode number 16, the Ashton Doolin special. Uh, yeah. Ashton Doolin just it so was... happened to wear number 16 and wear it for four seasons, the longest of any cult to wear the number. Uh, also, the only uh, NFL player to have attended Malone College in Northeast Ohio. Anyway, what were you going to say? Nah, yeah, he was, I, I believe he was injured this past year. He missed the entire season. Mm-hmm. I mean, sucks for him because he would have gotten, you know, with the injuries to Michael Pittman and Alec Pierce was not as productive. I mean, he would have seen the field a decent amount of time. Yeah. He was a, a proper, you know, run blocker. He, he was a nice guy to have at the number four, number five wide receiver spot. But he had tough luck with injuries. He was also, you know, a key special teams guy. He he gave it his his all there. But yeah, hopefully, I believe he's a free agent after this, you know, after this season. And you know, it's one of those guys where you're like, okay, if the Colts manage to keep him for for cheap contract, then you know, I'm all for it. Yeah, but yeah, we'll see. And I uh, I was born in Ohio. He's from Reynoldsburg, Ohio, so. Obviously, like you said, you know, he's on injury reserve this year. He'll be a free agent after the season's actually over. Uh, a, guy, a guy that for years, for the four years that he's been here, that's a guy that makes the roster. That's a guy that plays special teams. That's a guy that's be- being productive when he's out there. Like, that's a great pro, right? It's uh, yeah. It's unfortunate for a lot of people. Uh, players like Ashton Doolin will just fall by the wayside. Um, but I will remember like, uh, he stuck and he would make a play and he'd be like Ashton Doolin. Uh, and we've been talking about him, uh, behind the scenes for years, uh, as a, yeah. as a, that's a valuable member of your organization. So love to see him land on his feet, uh, six, two, two fifteen. he's only like 26 years old. So he's got time left. Yeah. I mean, he's, he's got plenty of time. He's just one of those guys, you know, where you're like, I mean, I'm all for keeping him around. He's a he's always, you know, a nice guy to have. Good special teams. I mean, proper yeah. value at the position. I mean, he's not gonna be the number one receiver, but you you you're not expecting that from him. No. So I yeah, mean, your one's... your your one through three is pretty locked up. You yeah. Know what I mean, so yeah. So yeah, this I've... this one's for you. <laughs> yeah. So let's talk about the Colts uh, first. Uh, they're in their their off season, right? The Colts didn't make the playoffs. Got real close, overachieved. They're years ahead of where, light years ahead of where I thought they'd be. Um, yeah, and I'm really excited about the future for the Colts. I have seen. Uh, we were just talking before we started recording about all these articles that have come out about the Colts letting go of Michael Pittman for pennies. Uh, that isn't going to happen. Yeah, right? like we were talking about. Like yeah, he's going to stay. That's with a the guy team. you franchise tag. You don't just let a guy that's like fifth in the NFL and receiving uh, you just don't let him walk uh, especially when you drafted him uh, and he's been nothing but like a good thing since he'd been here and yeah. he's been through some turmoil you know what I mean like hasn't had stability at quarterback hasn't had stability at head coach um, so obviously I think it's it's a no-brainer he either gets a deal or, or a franchise tag which one you want Um and, and and there's there's absolutely no way. Like I saw people saying like a couple second round picks for the kid, and it's just like, do you not understand math? Like he's still a first round pick value. You know what I mean? Like he's still worth a first round pick. Yeah. Like in trade, and people are like, oh yeah, give the Colts two two second round picks and a sixth, and they'll give you Michael Pittman. It's like, no. Yeah, that's not like, happening. That's yeah. not happening. Um, but yeah, that all that said, um. Some news came across the desk today uh, that I feel is like relevant to our audience, right? Like, so obviously, um, Jim Harbaugh uh, got announced as the new head coach of the of the Chargers. Um, play, he played there. Uh, obviously, he, he'll be in LA now. Um, but yeah, won, just won a national championship at Michigan, and it was under some scrutiny, right? Yeah, and I think he was in the in the position where it's like win and get out um and so he got a, a champ, national championship at the collegiate level and and i think la is one of the softer places to land uh and again we were talking about this before we started recording 
like it it mostly has to do with like he's not losing that job either um yeah he has the quarterback position is solved at in la like justin herbert can sling it yeah justin herbert is the guy for the and he's gonna be the the guy for the next 10 years you know what i mean so yeah he can he can really sling it Harbaugh can really coach quarterbacks to play above their shorts, and I'm putting a pin in that. We'll come back to that later because his little senior quarterback that had appeared in like three college football playoff games and won 10 or more games every year he played football, he's going to the Senior Bowl. I seen him practicing. He could really sling it too, so just put your pin in that because that kid could play too, and that's another quarterback that Harbaugh is going to have his has his hands all over. Um, but, yeah, he gets Herbert. But the issue with the Chargers, before we move on, I want to make sure we say, is that they're not that good. And yeah, they don't have such a great hell. roster. And so not only are they not very good, but they're going to lose some talent. And it'll be interesting the first year or two how Harbaugh and the new Chargers navigate that. But that just means that they're not projected to win very many games at all. And then they do all right. That's that's what I'm yeah. saying. The Chargers are a 500 ball club, probably the next couple of years. But make no mistake about it, they have a there is a new challenger in the West, and I actually think like the Chargers are a playoff team in a couple in a year or two, no problem. Yeah, um, I mean, so it's just not a great, it it's not a great first year situation. Like it's okay, it's not great. It sucks for them because they are like. In an, in an awkward position where you have, you know, the three established top dogs of four. I mean, you have the Ravens, the Bengals, the Chiefs, and the, and the Bills, who are all, you know, if their quarterback remains healthy, they're basically a lock to make the playoffs. You have those four with their head coach and quarterback already, you know, with continuity. They know each other. They've been there. They've been winning games. Yeah. And and they have a you know they are better at roster building they have a better roster they have better players and then you have teams like you know the Colts the Texans the Jaguars all teams with you know quarterbacks on cheaper deals especially you know the Texans and the Colts they have you know rookie quarterbacks. quarterbacks on rookie deals for the next four years I mean of course that gives them a chance to build you know a better roster all around the quarterback. Uh, the McOrions and Shane Sykin are all, I mean, they have proved it this season. They are good head coaches. Yeah. I mean, I, I think that's beyond debatable. So there, you know, you have six to seven teams, depending on what the ja- Jacks do, because, I mean, the Jaguars are really hard to figure out. I thought it was this was going to be their year, and they crashed out of the playoffs. But, I mean, you have at least six teams that are, you know, in a better position than you. Yeah. So that's they are also, you know, in a very tough division yeah. against, you know, they have to play against the Chiefs and the and the Broncos twice. Raiders, I don't know how they're gonna look, but you know, they are always a tough out. You know, the Raiders are never an easy game to have. Mm-hmm. So I mean they, they are just in a weird spot. Yeah, weird spot indeed. Um also I saw the that Indianapolis will get to host the combine through 2025 so obviously it'll be here this year it'll also be here next year that's big a lot of people that i know and love work in indianapolis uh and their business is sort of reliant on big out big things like that um so obviously the you know the combine is one of those things that the 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 city gets to host uh that brings a lot of money to the city a lot of attention to the city um so we're certainly excited about that um but yeah the the colts being in their off season, uh, a lot of uh, former or not former, a lot of current staff are interviewing for promotions elsewhere. Yeah, a lot of the, a lot of the noise was Dodds uh, to be the GM uh, for the Chargers. They made a hire earlier today, so that's not going to happen. Dodds, yeah, that's not Dodds a for the Chargers was a dream. Um, we want our, our coaches to stick around. We're looking for continuity here. Um, I think that, and then I, I did see, uh, to close, I did see a lot of articles projecting the Colts to draft a wide receiver in the first round. And I'm going to catch flack for this one, but it's just true. This is the best, what the Colts wide receiver room has looked in a decade. Yeah. Um, or more. 
Uh, I think that Michael Pittman Jr. is a legitimate one on a lot of football teams. Um, I also think that Alec Pierce, the role that he is playing and the outcomes don't match up. But that doesn't take away from what he does on a defense uh, to a defense. Yeah, and I think with um, with Richardson in, you'll see him get more attention. Um, and again, if he's re- being a decoy and the offense is moving underneath him, that's the point. Now, if he's being used as a decoy and we're not moving the ball, then we need him to get more separation, right? But that's another conversation for another time. That's called yeah. a really good I number mean- two. That's what yeah, that's I mean, how, like <laughs> how you know how many times this season, I mean, watching because you know, we watch every single Colts game, we watch every snap, we watch every play, and you know, perhaps a more casual fan are you know, they go over, they look at Alec Pierce's stat line and they say, Oh, hey, Alec Pierce had a terrible season, he was not productive, he only had like I believe it was 30 reception. Ah, yeah, he's not good. The Colts, you know, they drafted a bust. Mm-hmm. we you know we watch the games and you know having watched the games i'm like with a good quarterback this guy has you know at least six touchdowns and perhaps you know we are talking over 800 yards mm-hmm. and that's a much different story there i believe it was once a game i mean it seemed like once a game of course you know i might be exaggerating but he was wide open down the sideline and you know Gardner Minshew, he either missed him or he you know started panicking and you know, he starts feeling the pressure and yeah. having watched what little we, we saw from Anthony Richardson, that's a guy that can evade the pressure with ease. And the, the one thing I saw that makes me, you know, the most the most excited about a quarterback like Richardson, he's getting away from the pressure, but he keeps his eyes down the field. Yeah, he's a I mean, ball he's not, he's not. Yeah, he's not panicking and, you know, scrambling at every chance he gets like, okay, you know, like Justin Fields does when he starts feeling the pressure, he's like, okay, he yeah, just I'm just off. running. Yeah. yeah. He just takes off, you know, completely, completely forgets about the pass. Mm-hmm. But you have a guy like Anthony Richardson who manages to keep his eyes down the field and you're like, okay, with him back next year, Alec Pierce is going to get a lot more targets because mm-hmm. he got open. I mean, he yeah. ran deep routes, but he got open. And, you know, you might be talking, like, about a guy. I mean, you have Jonathan Taylor in the backfield. He could have, I mean, he could have a breakout year, right? Like, yeah, he, he, he could, he could really be I'm heavily already, involved in this yeah. offense. I um, already called it. Like, I, I, I wrote in an article and about, you know, the position on light outlook. And for Alec Pierce, I said, hey, you can quote me on this. You can come back in, in case I'm wrong. You can come back and, you know, call me out. But make sure to draft Alec Pierce in your fantasy draft next year, perhaps in the last round. Because I, I don't think he's getting drafted. Make sure to do so because you have Jonathan Taylor taking attention away from him. You have Michael Pittman probably taking attention away from him. Downs. You have Jelani Woods back. You have Josh Downs. You can all, you 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 don't. I mean, it will be tough for opposing defenses to you know put two safeties back, play cover two. You do that, and I'm killing with we we with Jonathan Taylor. You know, I'm daring you to stop this. You put eight eight guys in the box. That leaves Alec Pierce one on one, and you know he can get that separation on a deep route. Yeah, and Anthony Richardson is a guy that he can escape the pressure, and and you know he has a rocket. I mean, he can yeah. throw the ball what like seventy yards off platform. So you're oh, like, I mean, it and that was up, what like, I thought we, was great. You know, we'll remember. I'll remember that forever. You know, I think if we think back to before this time last year, we were talking about, um. Who's got the big arm? And I can't, I'm drawing a blank. I hate when it happens. The quarterback for Tennessee now. Yeah, Will uh, Levis. He Will Levis. Will Levis going into the into the combine. He's got the biggest arm. He's going to wow everybody with his arm. And when he uh, took the warm up off, uh, he looked really muscular and veiny, like he'd really been working out before the combine. And when he let it go, I thought, oh, no. It's not that good. Yeah. But that's just because there were other people there that really did blow you away with the sort of power that they were able to generate and the the distance they were able to throw. And I just want to point out, it's C.J. Stroud and Anthony Richardson that when you look back at that combine and you watch them 
do the drill where he drops back, settles, ro- then has to roll out, stop, and deliver. Who's wowing you with velocity and yeah. accuracy on a deep ball? Anthony Richardson and CJ Stroud. Now, I I just want to say that all to say, like going into this draft, I'm hearing a lot of people talking about the Colts getting rid of their number one wide receiver. Those are literal articles hmm. that are being written. I'm guessing that's AI because there's no there's no actual football fan yeah. writing that. And then also that the Colts are going to draft a wide receiver in the first round. And I just want to point out how dumb that is. Because as I've said, the Colts have the best wide receiver room that organizations had in years. And I don't think loading that room is necessarily correct. I I actually think the tight end room needs more help because those tight ends have been injured. And those tight ends have not played every game. And those tight ends have not consistently performed and haven't been a household name uh, in a long time. And I actually think if we're going to pick on a position and talk about people potentially losing their jobs and talking about adding to the room, I think the tight end room obviously gets a look on the offensive line. Uh, and then, of course, I'm all about building for depth, right? So, again, I want to reinforce my offensive line. I would more look at the defensive side of the football and the fact that, yeah, you've got EJ Speed, you've got Zaire Franklin. Who who else plays linebacker? Da, na, 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 na. Can you yeah. name one? Nope. How about the secondary? We had a bunch of guys get injured before the season even started. Guys got suspended for the year. Like the cornerback room, very obviously going to need some help because we played from behind yeah. all year long. So in my opinion, and again, I haven't really written about uh, written for the site in months, right? Because uh, they got rid of me and decided to hire cronies uh, instead. Um, but when I think about the Colts, if I'm, uttering a word it's like don't touch my offense offense was really good offense was really good with a backup quarterback right let's look to the future i think we're going to be fine on offense if i'm looking at a part of this team that needs help it's the defense because they were they were bad to awful yeah they were bad yeah they were so bad that the colts got rid of shaquille Right, like they got real of Shaq Leonard, they cut him because he wasn't worth it, and it took him weeks after being traded to even have a good game. And yeah, then, he uh, had just one, and he's you know he's rumored to perhaps retire this offseason. He, I mean, ooh, that is just a not far there anymore. Ball. Yeah, because the and... same sorts of problems he was having in Indy were present on film, where he literally. He did not break down enough, and he did not have the short area quickness to react to a cut and make a tackle. The guy went right around him. And a couple years ago, that would have never happened. And there are certain things you just don't get back once you lose them. And and that sort of like uh, he had – he had uh, some years for the Colts where, again, just just like Ashton Doolin, where that guy's like a really integral part of our team and a part of our strategy. Uh, and and when he was healthy, super productive, one of the best linebackers in the league. Uh, that torch got passed, though. And I think we got to, like, we got to let him go because Zaire Franklin's, like, really damn good at his job. Yeah, Zaire's uh, really good. EJ Speed, he has shown yeah. flashes. Yeah. And the positions I'm the most worried about are, you know, first of all, I think Corner. the Colts really need a, a pass rusher. Oh, for sure. To Like, to begin with, because, you know, again, perhaps some casual fans are saying, hey, you know, we broke the franchise record for sacks. You know, this defensive line is playing you were great. Getting, you were getting but... support from everywhere, though. It wasn't like your pass rush from your defensive ends was good. Yeah, and it was like, you no, had... you were getting it from everywhere, you know? And you have i mean you're not getting that consistent pressure and you know watch the game i mean there were several times you know for example against cj stroud there was no pass rush at all i mean they were not there i mean you don't have a guy when you know i'm looking at the teams that have you know i'm looking at the best teams the best defenses 
and they have that that guy, you know, that can win one on one, that can you know destroy a game plan. You're talking about, of of course, you know, you have your elite guys like Miles Garrett, like you know Chris Jones, um, and plenty more. But you know, you need a guy that that is like you know pass for a specialist, yeah. And that's you know, a, that's a pay. pass rush specialist. See that that's a yeah. thing that De- DeForest Buckner's not right. DeForest not, Buckner is like a great defensive lineman, but he's not. A, that's not his specialty. Is not pass rushing. And you're right. The Colts did break a franchise record for sacks. But again, it's one of those situations where, like, if you actually break down the film and watch what happened in the play, um, there's a lot of contributing factors to that, and it sort of starts with like the reverse engineering, right? Like what the Colts are trying to build towards other teams are failing to do. And that is like reinforce your offensive line so that you're able to protect somebody. Uh, And other teams are failing at that too. That plays just as much into your sack total as you putting guys on your team that are good at rushing the passer. Right. I also think that when the Colts have invested in the, in the, in recent, time anyway in pass rushers it hasn't panned out and it has been draft picks and actual veteran signees that haven't panned out so that's been kind of like a miss um but i also think that there's only like a handful of good pass rushers and that yeah otherwise there isn't much of a pass rush in the nfl and there are teams that their quarterbacks get sacked a whole bunch and hit a whole bunch um and the colts quarterbacks the quarterback is also responsible for some of the pressure that they take. And yeah. Garner Minshew's, uh, on his list of weaknesses, uh, avoiding and not creating pressure for yourself it is not one of his strengths. Those aren't his strengths. That's yeah. not in his wheelhouse. So obviously the offensive line looked fantastic this year. Um, Hopefully they're able to have a couple years of that play because like I said, yeah. I just yeah, want to which... get Anthony Richardson back and healthy and on the field. Um, and again, I, I just, the whole point of like bringing it up where it's like articles are being written that like the Colts are getting rid of receiver and drafting receivers. And it's like, they actually don't need to touch it. It's that's actually good. There are other things, there are other positions that you could like probably invest picks in before receiver right like i've said like cornerback tight end yeah who name another linebacker outside of ej speed or or zaire franklin it's like who else is getting reps nobody who's getting pass rush reps who's the main pass rusher for the like you don't have that person that you say like that's their pass rush specialist 10 plus sacks right he's he's on the the hook for a sacker to the the one the one I really like that I, I wish, you know, I'm just I'm manifesting it that hopefully it happens is, you know, Josh Allen from the Jacks. I mean, because that would be like a dual. I mean, that would be good on both sides because now you don't have to face him twice a year. And he always, yeah. I mean, if you look at, you know, the, the box score, he always has at least one and a half sacks against us. Always. I mean, no matter what. And you get a proven pass rusher. And you take that away from, you know, a divisional rival. And again, you know, like you have your you quarterback. Take their heart. Yeah. I mean, I actually, you have a quarterback. I actually can tell you what happened in Jacksonville and why it's so hard to win when you play your home games in Jacksonville, Florida. Okay. Jacksonville, Florida is far enough north Florida that it doesn't feel like it's in Florida. The weather systems that pass through Jacksonville miss the southern part of the state. So when you live here and you work here, and I'm talking about in Jacksonville, Florida, it's yeah. one of the more depressing places to live because it's like you're just up the road from Orlando, which gets all of those good weather system where you just go just a little north and you go into Jacksonville and it, it just doesn't feel like Florida anymore. It, it feels like a, a suburb and yeah. a lot of people. Yeah. Cause my dad was an air traffic controller and a lot of his buddies took jobs in Jacksonville and then moved back and were like, I'd rather live outside of Chicago and, and face Chicago traffic than live in Jacksonville. <laughs> yeah, it's like the there. most depressing. Apparently think about, and this is gallows level humor. So 
for those that are uninitiated, we do that here. Um, so a lot of people talk about how like it's depressing to live in the Midwest in the winter because it's cold. Imagine you live in Florida, except you get the same weather that I get in Indiana. That's yeah, what I'm talking about. So people like, I'm going to go live, move my family and I'm an air traffic controller, right? Which has like a super high suicide rate. And we all move to Jacksonville, Florida to work and get even more depressed and have to move our families back to the Midwest to be near our families in case we decide yeah. to off ourselves because Jacksonville, Florida sucks. So <laughs> it's just, these are just facts. I'm, this has nothing to do with the Jags. That's an expansion team. Y'all can have it. They ain't never going to be good again. They got one. They're never going to be good again. Uh, I think it has to do with where they live. So, uh, I, and that it was mostly like a joke. Like I said, that's gallows level humor, baby. Like air traffic controllers that moved there had to leave because it's like you make good money. You want to live somewhere nice. And like Jacksonville, Florida is not it. So yeah, that. That right there tells you why in the world would they play so good to start a season and fall off at the end. Imagine playing your home games in Florida and people don't show up because it's 40 or less <laughs> no, degrees yeah. outside. And we're in Florida. I'm not going to that game, right? So that, and again, little soliloquy on Jacksonville. It's dog truth. I've never heard a good thing about, like, I'm not, again, I'm not talking about the Jags, Right. I'm not talking about Shahir Khan or whatever, Shahid Khan, like the yeah, owner of the Jags. The I'm not yeah. talking about him. I'm not talking about the franchise or the team or the players. I'm talking about the town. There I have I've yet to I've yet to hear anyone say, Oh, I can't imagine myself anywhere else other than Jacksonville, Florida. You know what I mean? Like it's gotta be, I would argue, argue, you would rather play in Cleveland than Jacksonville. Right. Yeah, now. at least the fans. At least yeah. the fans are passionate there. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Like, you would rather be a cle you you would rather be a Raider than go play in Jacksonville. Who yeah, who I mean, for, for the longest you're, you're time the Raiders played on a friggin' baseball field. Okay, that's what I that's what I'm saying. Like, you would you would rather be a Raider than, than play than play in Jacksonville. Yeah. So I'm not surprised that Jacksonville fell off. I don't think that they're a quagmire. I I think that. Trevor Lawrence is good, but there's just there's just too much greatness required to win uh, if you can't get it all done through your quarterback. And so what I'm saying is, like, Trevor Lawrence is a top half of the league quarterback. Yeah. But, but he's not in the first quartile, so he's not a top eight quarterback. And that just yeah, means he's, that yeah. he's not winning any games by himself. It's going to take a lot for him to consistently win. And so when he requires a healthy investment to be successful, and the, even if he's able to keep himself upright, the pieces around him are going to get injured. It's just part of this game. Yeah, and it's that's, part of, yeah it that's how they're hurting is like they have no continuity. Um, again, again, that whole thing about it, they're in Jacksonville, Florida. Um, but they also – Again, I, I I just think that the division looks the division outlook for for Tennessee is the worst, right? Yeah, Their coach. Yeah, got and they fired. just lost. Yeah, um, they have they have literal. They are devoid of talent. Um, Jacksonville, in my eyes, is somewhere between them and Houston and Indy. Because yeah, obviously it kind of flip flopped at the end. It could have gone either way, and I'm really like, this is stupid. Uh, I think that C.J. Stroud is a top eight quarterback, and that he can win you games. Um, I've I've seen enough out of Anthony Richardson to say the same. Uh, we'll just see if he can keep himself upright. So do you see where I'm at with my rankings of like? Trevor Lawrence, yeah. CJ Stroud, Anthony Richardson. CJ Stroud had a great rookie campaign. I don't see a sophomore slump from him. I actually think Houston, 
I again, I don't think they could build a better team than the than like the Colts next year. I think the Colts would still have a better roster. Yeah, but they did a lot with a little this year, and that says something. Um, so yeah, I think that's that good on. I'm good on the Colts. Ready to talk Pacers? If yeah. you're ready to talk about the Pacers, baby. Uh, obviously, it's not news. It's just that since the last time you and I spoke, the Pacers did what you said to do, man. Like you literally <laughs> yeah, been telling me yeah. for for since the start of the season, love the Pacers. They need a second star. They need someone on their team that can carry the load in the event that Halley has a bad night or, or he's not playing. Um the Pacers traded, correct me when I'm wrong. I think it was three firsts. Yeah, three first and Bruce Brown and Jordan and Wara. And Jordan Wara. Okay. So first of all, uh thank you to Bruce Brown and Jordan Wara. Um definitely gonna be fine. They're gonna their NBA careers are going to continue. Um, yeah. as far as the three firsts, um I think that the Pacers are in a playoff window. For the next two, three years, I think they'll actually yeah. win a lot of basketball games potentially make the playoffs. That means that those draft picks that they traded are like late first round picks. And so two of them, I don't even care about. Okay. The third one, I'm like, eh. It hey, my D, my D, D, D. Yeah. Huh? Yeah. So I, first things, first impressions, uh, Pascal Siakam in his first game as a pacer was plus 17, had 21 points. Six and I'm not even looking at it anymore. 21 points, six rebounds, uh, three assists, and a steal uh, in his first game as a Pacer. So in terms of contribution, solid, like super solid. Yeah. Now something to keep in mind that since that three point home loss to the Blazers, which you can entirely blame on the Pacers bench for underperforming, um, the Pacers have now lost three games in a row, and it's a blip on the radar to me. Um, yeah, no, losses, no reason for concern. No, two at, at of least the three at the losses moment. are against good teams, right? So losing against good teams with a roster that you've just turned over, um, these aren't hurting anybody. Um, what you'll look to see is what happens once you get um, Pascal Siakam and uh, Halliburton out there together. Then, then we can have a conversation of what yeah, build some continuity there. Yeah, because I really, I really think once have them play together a a few games, yeah. Once they get into the rhythm, perhaps you know after the All Star break. Yeah, and then you're getting Jalen Smith back too. Halliburton's out through Saturday, uh, so the team does have a game tomorrow. Um, They are playing. um, Who are they playing tomorrow? Is is it the? I feel like every time we record, it's the Wizards or the Seventy Sixers. Yeah, so they're they are playing the uh 76ers tomorrow which is a tough ask that is one of the better teams in the league um that said though uh Joel Embiid just had 62 points in a basketball game um that can have an impact on your next games I'm all I'm saying is that's a lot of usage um and there's a chance he has an off night and then the the Pacers are able to capitalize otherwise it would be kind of difficult to expect a team without its star point guard to play against one of the better teams in the NBA whose star just scored 62 points. Um, But yeah, hopefully Halliburton's back soon. Uh, You're able to see what the Pacers are, are, are are capable of doing Um, because yeah, like we, like we've been, like we've been saying uh, 24 and 20 right now. uh, We're a little over halfway through the season. And if you think about, okay, so 42 games, 41 games is the halfway point, right? So the Pacers were 21 and 20. You just double that, right? So that's 42 yeah. wins. That's that. It, that's if they it just are the same team the rest of the way that they were in the first half, okay? Uh, 42 wins is plus seven from last year. Plus seven wins last year puts you in the playoffs. Yeah. Um, and again, no, that's not true. They were 24 and 17 at the 41. 
24 and 17 is 48 wins. Sorry, 48 wins. Yeah. They were at 35 last year. That's plus 13. So there is a there is a really good chance here that the the obviously a lot of things have to go in their favor, but the the Pacers have made the biggest trade that I can remember. Hmm. Um, I think that Pascal Siakam is underrated. Um, as far as like how, the quality of career that he's had. Uh, I think that what he brings is what we need, and I'm and the thing yeah. that I that an I NBA will be champion. thinking about the thing I, well yeah, the thing that I'll be thinking about as this goes is there's a picture from the All Star game last year of Halliburton and Siakam looking at a camera together, and when you see the like the quality of interaction that they're having right in that moment, it led to this. And so it's something that will stick out to me. Like those those guys were buddies before now. Yeah. And now they're on the same. And I get it. Everybody loves Halliburton, <laughs> right? Because he dishes that rock, right? Um, but I think that you're gonna see the Pacers get out and run on people more and run people out of the gym. And and it's what the Pacers are doing and building is exactly how I would coach a basketball team to just run them out of the gym and shoot and then shoot them out of the gym down the stretch. Right. Um, so yeah, I'm really excited about the Pacers made a franchise forever franchise altering move. And I don't think that they gave up too much where it's like, Oh, that's no, unreasonable. Yeah. Um, and, and also, I mean, if you consider like how bad the Pacers have been at drafting in recent years, like in that, you know, 15 to 20 range. I mean, I yeah. saw it and it was well, guys how hard? like... It's, it's just super hard, right? They, to they draft got, you know, late yeah. in the round. I mean, Aaron Holiday, Goga, Bidatse, you have... Um, who's the, the other record, one? I mean, TJ Leaf. Yeah. I mean, that's guys where I'm like, yeah, I'm not at all worried. I mean, if you told me right now, like, hey, you're 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 gonna trade, you know, Goga, Aaron Holiday, and DJ Leaf for Pascal Siakam, I'm like, yeah, I mean, do it in a heartbeat because you know Siakam's got four or five years left of high yeah. level basketball at least. Um, but yeah, the the Pacers are doing it. I, I again, I feel like I say this all the time. Like, one of the best times to be like a Colts and Pacers fan um, is you haven't already won it, right? That that afterglow of winning the Super Bowl in 06, like the next like four or five years were a blur. Um, but now it's like before all of the success that that comes to the organization, uh, organizations. Um, so again, I want to make sure we were saying in this new year, hey man, thank you for sitting down with me and talking about the Colts and Pacers. I feel like we've got yeah. a unique thing here and it's a like – I never look at the metrics. I don't look at listens. I don't look at views. I don't look at any of that shit. I don't even think about that. I think about the quality time that I get to spend with one yeah. of my colleagues who shares a passion for the things that I care about, right? Like we both care about the Colts and Pacers enough that yeah. we're not sitting on here. We're not sitting in a podcast being sensationalists, right? We're not making up news. We're not spending our time prognosticating yeah. about things that we don't know about, right? Um, but what I do want to do, uh, if it's okay with you, is get, try to talk about who we think is going to win the conference championships this weekend, if it, if that's okay. So, hey, yeah, sure. uh, obviously, this is an NFL podcast, and the Colts aren't in the playoffs. Um, and we didn't do this every week because we don't meet every week if the Colts aren't playing. Yeah, We, we, we say we're going to meet every other week because that's reasonable. But now we're in the playoffs, and hey, man, um, this weekend on Sunday, the Chiefs play the Ravens. That's in Baltimore. Um, yeah. Baltimore is a three and a half point home favorite. Just so you know, over under is forty four and a half. Who do you think wins the Chiefs Ravens game? Yeah, I think it's the Ravens. Me too. I mean, I think it's about time for Lamar. So I also, to you know, the Chiefs, man. Yeah, I, I also, you know, I might be subjective here, but I also wish it's the Ravens, you know, like I want that Ravens. And, and I mean, also, I'm, I don't want to get ahead of myself. I'll talk about this later, but a, a certain Super Bowl rematch would also be, you know, exciting to watch. 
by going to, to the other conference, you know, perhaps getting a bit ahead of myself. But I also, um, I, I don't think it's popular to say this, but I really don't like, you know, the, the way the media are all like, hey, Mahomes is it's the second coming of, of Tom Brady. He's the, the next greatest thing. And also, I kind of really don't like when games, you know, they are about something that's outside the game, like Taylor Swift, what is happening with Travis Kelsey. Like, you watch the game, and they are pointing at her like, 10 to 15 times each game. And I'm like, come on, man. Like, this is football. This is not, I, I want to see the game. I want to, I mean, I want better content. I'm not here to watch, you know, Taylor Swift. I mean, if Travis Kelsey, you know, that's great for him. Yeah. I don't care about that. You know, you know why? Do you know her. why? Do you know why, though? There's a reason that it's happening and it has nothing to do with Taylor Swift or Kansas City. Do you know why? Taylor Swift's social media profile is 10 times larger yeah. than the NFL. So the idiotas that work in the NFL marketing department think this is what people want to see. People want to see. Now, here's for the record. I wanted to see. What happens when you put Taylor Swift in the same room as uh, the other Kelsey, right? Yeah. He takes his shirt off and gets drunk and jumps down in the stands, and he's a crazy person. Who's the that's best the guy I ever, like. Right? Yeah, that's the guy I like. I was like, yeah, man. I, but I agree. I mean, but yeah, I agree. Jason. There, were, there, were some, there were some times when some things would happen, and they'd cut to her, and she'd have, like, a, a great celebration. Totally worth that, okay? There are, however – many times where they cut to her and she's staring at her phone bro like she could have been anybody in the stands just doing this and they, they would have just panned right on by but because it's taylor swift and she has 10 times the followers that the nfl does they are on her like a hawk and it, it does it gets to the point where you're like is this a football game or is this like the yeah, I mean, concert i'm not watching you know yeah I mean? This, so is this is not a reality and, show. This is not reality TV. And and I also <laughs> I mean that's I mean Lamar, if you remember, you know, in the off season, they were like, okay, yeah, they don't they don't want to extend him, they don't want to pay him the money. And I always like, you know, those sort of of stories where a guy, you know, that has plenty of dollars in the off season, he comes in, he puts in the work, he's you know, in my books, he's the MVP of the league. And for him to get to the Super Bowl, yeah, that that'd be great. And you know, we would also have at least a different team than than the past. Yeah, what like what is it like? Yeah, Chiefs. Well, the yeah. thing about the thing about Lamar Jackson that I will always keep on the front of my mind is that you know, man, when he was in college, um, just a go back in time five or six years i remember watching him and thinking like there's no way that's not a top five draft pick he's the best athlete on the field in every contest uh he's got one of the better arms one of the better arms i didn't say that he was came into the league and he was a great passer that would be incorrect but what he's done since he's come into the league is become one of the best passers um, one of the very best this year too. And a lot of people will point to like touchdowns and interceptions, but that's not what makes you a great passer. It's about ball location. Um, what happens on the other end of that has a lot to do with the quality of the people in that room. Uh, and that what ha what has been in question for the Ravens for the last several years is the quality of their receiving room. Um, they'll be getting, I, I believe they get Mark Andrews back for this game. If that's the case, Baltimore wins this game and it's not close. This is like a 10 point game to me. However, comma, the one I'm not so sure about, mostly because it conflicts with my emotions. The Lions play at the 49ers, which is actually a good thing. Uh, and San Francisco is a seven point favorite just up front. So who do you think wins that game, which is played at like 3.30 their time? In the afternoon, okay. Yeah, I think in, in yeah, LA, that, that or in, in San Fran. Sorry, 
Yeah, I think that's one that one is, you know, undoubtedly the 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 Niners. I think that the difference in talent is just too much. I think they they have the better offensive system. They're they're playing at home. You you have you have Christian McCaffrey, you have Brandon Ayuk, you have George Kittle, you have the defense that will make life hell for Jared Goff. And I mean I love the story about the Lions. Like I said, you know, I always like when a guy comes in and proves everyone wrong. I think that has been the case with, you know, Lions coach Dan Campbell. I remember everyone making fun of him, you know, for the press conference where where he was saying about, about like, hey, we're going to. Yeah, biting your kneecap off. And everyone was just making fun of him for the way and the Lions, they had been terrible. And they were like, oh, you know, here comes another poster. And now they're, they're in the conference championship. And I saw something that, you know, that really made me laugh. Jared Goff has now been to the NFC Conference Championship twice with two different teams. And Dak Prescott has not, I mean, he he has not even touched the Conference Championship. So, yeah, there you go, Dallas <laughs> Cowboys fans. You are simply, and, and you know, oh I'm a Colts God. fan. Yeah. And, and even I am telling you that's pathetic. Pathetic. Yeah. So... But that has a that has a lot. I'm going with the rate. I'm going with the institutional control there. Yeah. Uh, so you're taking San Fran going away. So yeah. th- like San I said, Fran. this is this is one of those games where what I what I'm pretty positive is going to happen, which is agree with you. So okay, I'm pretty positive the 49ers win this going away. Here's why: uh, they already played, and uh, the final was 33-19. Uh, Balt or Baltimore, San Fran won by two touchdowns. Now. The only reason they're not like a 12 and a half point favorite is because Debo hurt his shoulder, right? Yeah. So I'm actually taking the Lions to keep it close. So while, again, I'm pretty sure this is San Fran going away. Um, the shoulder injury to Debo kind of makes me go... Lions could sneak up on you if you aren't yeah. at full strength. Um, and so, obviously, I feel like I would be crazy sitting here saying, like, I actually think the Lions win this game. No, I'm not saying that. I just think that it's not the blowout that that, that Yeah, Vegas many people are expecting. Yeah. Yeah, I just think that that's, uh, that's lazy. Um, because what you're doing is you're taking a singular, very recent result and using it to hold up your argument. That's like, that's like two months old. People change, things change, dreams change. Um, and, and, and as far as, as Dan Campbell, you know, what's crazy when you coach football is it becomes very real. Like football becomes very real when people get hurt. Right. Especially when like somebody's actually good at this game and like one of your best players and they get hurt. Um, And the way that parallels me, my very first job as a high school football coach, we had a young sophomore player that was clearly our best player. Um, He was the kind of kid that you'd put him at linebacker on the backside of a play and he would chase down the back and make a tackle for the loss on the opposite side of the field. And you'd be like, oh, shit, he's a sophomore. He only weighs like 180 pounds. He's killing boys. Uh, He got uh, cheap shotted in the first game and and was out for the the concussion. Um, And when he came back again, it took him a game or two to get back in a rhythm. But like he's a game changer. And that's like someone that you want on your football team. Right. And so I'll, I'll always remember uh, Campbell when he's begging the guys to trust him. I have a plan. You got to get your reps in your, your stress in is what he was calling it. Talking about contact. And, and if you don't, I'm not setting you up to be successful. Right. And you got to believe me. You got to trust me. I have yeah. a plan. I know what I'm doing. Now they're in the NFC championship. So it's like, do you believe that? Did you believe him when yeah. he said, like, I have a plan. We have to have contact in practice to prepare for games. And, hey, he got you to the mountaintop. Yeah. You're now here. Do I? Do I think that all of that? 
can get you this win here? I don't. Uh, and so, yeah, I think that's a good place to leave it is like, we're, we want, we think the, the Ravens are going to win. We also think the 49ers are going to win. Like I've said, I just think that game on yeah. Sunday is a little closer than you think. And, um, I'm just, I'm really excited. Uh, just in general, man, like I said, the, you, when I talk to you, my friend, and I'm like, how are you feeling about them Pacers? And you're like, Hey, I feel great, but they needed to add a guy. They need yeah. a, a yeah. second star. Hey man, it happened. Right. And then as far as the Pacers, like, I don't know about you, but it's like every day that passes and they're like interview, interview, interview higher. And it ain't a Colts guy. I'm like, yes, that means we get to keep our people and that those yeah. people like really want to be a part of what we're building here. Right. And like, they kind of want to they get a better picture. Yeah, of that it makes puzzle, sense. Right. Yeah. Um, so it feels real good. And obviously like anytime a former Colt becomes a head coach, we're going to talk about that. Anytime the city, the Colts play in, uh get to host the combine again next year we're gonna talk about that too uh yeah. so yeah again this has been season two episode 16 of um the cultist uh enjoy the couple playoff games here and and we'll see you in a couple weeks yeah